Hi everybody, this is David Farrell with another music theory video. In today's video, we're going to be discussing non-chord tones. This video is designed to give you an introduction to the concept and go over the classifications of all the basic types of non-chord tones. When we use the term non-chord tone, we're describing pitches that are present in the music that are not part of the primary harmony in a given moment. If we look at the short excerpt here, our primary harmony is a C major triad, and we can see that clearly in the bass clef staff, but our melody has a couple of pitches that don't belong to that C major chord. The F natural in the first measure, the D natural in the second measure, and even the A natural in our accompanimental harmonic voice is also not a part of the chord. This is pretty typical in most music. If every note only belonged to the primary harmony, the music would be uh, just a little bit more or less interesting, a little bit overly consonant. Non-chord tones allow us to present some different kinds of harmonic tension by creating dissonances in different voices against the main harmony. When we're analyzing these non-chord tones, we typically use parentheses. You can see I've used parentheses to indicate all the different pitches that don't belong to my C major triad. When we're describing non-chord tones, uh, we can do more than just say that they're non-chord tones, that they don't belong to the chord. We've actually got a system and a bunch of different classifications describing the different types of non-chord tones. And I'm going to introduce all of these uh, as we go forward, but I'll start by saying, in general, whenever we're classifying a non-chord tone, we're asking two questions. How do we approach the non-chord tone? And how do we resolve the non-chord tone? How do we get into the note? And how do we get out of the note? And so for each of the upcoming non-chord tones, that's going to be the main question I ask. How did we approach? And how did we resolve? Let's look at a couple of different examples. The passing tone is one of the most common non-chord tones, and I'm going to start discussing my non-chord tones here. The passing tone is approached by step, and it's resolved by step continuing in the same direction. Passing tones can be ascending, moving upwards, or descending, moving downwards. And you can see my passing tones here. I start on a C natural, which is part of the C major triad, and I move up to that D, which is not in the chord. That's my non-chord tone. I've approached it by step from below, and when I resolve it, I move to E, I move back to a chord tone, and I've kept going in the same direction. I approached it by step from below, and I continue going upwards. That's my resolution. In the next measure, I have a descending passing tone. I go down from G to F, F being my non-chord tone, and I keep moving in the same direction down to E, resolving back to a chord tone. Both of these are passing tones because they're approached by step and resolved by step continuing in the same direction. I've used the label PT to indicate that they're each passing tones. Another common non-chord tone is the neighbor tone. The neighbor tone, like the passing tone, is approached by step, but unlike the passing tone, it resolves in the opposite direction. It resolves back the way it came. Neighbors can be upper neighbors, in which case they're approached from below, they, and then they resolve back down, or they can be lower neighbors, in which case they're approached from above and resolve back upwards. Both of these non-chord tones present here in my example are neighbor tones. We can see C steps up to D and resolves by step back down to the same pitch, back to C. We go up and then we go in the opposite direction, we go back down. Similarly, my F sharp in the second measure is resolved by step from above, G steps down to F sharp, and then it goes back where it came to G. These are just like little neighbors, they sit next door to our primary chord tone, we step to them, and then we go right back where we came. I'll note that one of these is a diatonic non-chord tone, the D natural, and one is a chromatic non-chord tone. Chroma uh, non-chord tones can be diatonic or chromatic in general. It doesn't really change how we analyze them, whether they belong to the key signature or not. The passing tone and the neighbor tone both use stepwise resolutions and approaches only. The appoggiatura is a different kind of non-chord tone. The appoggiatura is approached by leap and resolved by step. So we jump to the non-chord tone and then we resolve by step. Most typically, the appoggiatura resolves in the opposite direction. And so you can see in my first measure, I leaped up to the F from C 
And then I resolved in the opposite direction. I resolved down by step. And likewise, in the second measure, I did the same thing. I leaped down from G to D, D being my non-core tone, but then I resolved back upwards in my step. That's the most typical thing we'll see with appoggiaturas. Appoggiaturas often occur on strong beats. You can see that I've, I have my appoggiaturas on beat three and their resolutions on weaker beats on week four. And so if we're writing with these, those are some nice tips uh, to get uh, a very idiomatic sound. The appoggiatura then, a leaping non-chord tone approached by leap and resolved by step. The flip of the appoggiatura is the escape tone, lovingly referred to sometimes as the escape. It is approached by step and resolved by leap. This is the opposite of the appoggiatura in which we leap to the non chord tone and then step away. Here we step to the non chord tone and leap away. Again, escape tones frequently resolve in the opposite direction, and so both of my escape tones do that here. We can see that G steps upward to an A, a being the non chord tone, A not belonging to my C major triad, and then leaps back down to the E for its resolution. And likewise in the second measure, E steps to D, D being a non chord tone, it doesn't belong to my C major triad, and then leaps up to the G. This is the escape tone. I've used the shorthand of ET to label my escape tones in this example, another of our typical non chord tones. Next we have what we call the double neighbor. This is a little bit of a unique one because it involves two non-chord tones. You may encounter it referred to also as the neighbor group or changing tones. It has a couple of different names. The double neighbor is a combination of both an upper neighbor and a lower neighbor that are connected with a leap. And so we can see in the first measure here, above my C major triad, I have C and I have its upper neighbor, a D natural, and its lower neighbor, a B natural. And what I've done is I've combined both of these in the middle to create a pair of non-chord tones. The D is the upper neighbor and the B is the lower neighbor, and I jump between them before I end up back where I started. We have the double neighbor here, two non-chord tones, both the upper neighbor and the lower neighbor. In the second measure, I've done the same thing around E, and we note that here I have the lower neighbor first. I step down to the D, I leap up to the F, and then I resolve back by step to E. There are two stepwise motions in here, a stepwise approach and a stepwise resolution, but there's a leap in the middle between those two non-chord tones. And so this one is a little bit unusual because it has more than one pitch as a part of it. Um, just want to have this one in the back of our minds as we're composing or analyzing music, the double neighbor. Our last set of non-chord tones involve common tones. These involve non-chord tones that do not change. Instead, the chord changes while the note stays the same. And so you can see my example has changed just a little bit because I have a harmonic change. I move from a C major triad to an F major triad in the second measure. The first of these non-chord tones that I'll discuss is the suspension. The suspension is approached by common tone and it resolves down by step. Common tone means that the note doesn't change but the chord changes. And so here we have a G on the second half of our first measure. The G is a chord tone in that measure. It belongs to the C major triad beneath it. But on the beginning of measure two, when my chord changes to F major, it becomes a non-chord tone. I say it's approached by common tone, which basically means that the note has stayed the same, but everything else around it has changed to become a non-chord tone. It resolves down by step, and that is what characterizes it as a suspension. We can think of a suspension as a non-chord tone that changes too late, right? All the other ch voices, uh, the chord has changed, but this note kind of forgot to change a little bit, and then it changes just a little bit after everybody else. All the other voices arrived at the chord on beat one, and my example, my suspended voice arrived just a little bit late. It arrived at the chord tone on beat three. Suspensions usually involve a little bit more analysis. They're some of the most common non-chord tones, considered very, very smooth, and they show up in a lot of music. Uh, when we talk about suspensions, we typically describe them with numeric intervals above the bass note. 
And so if we look at the example here, we can see what I'm describing. I start with the same suspension that I just had, a G natural that resolves down by step to F natural. It is of course approached by common tone which makes it a suspension. But if I was truly describing this I wouldn't really stop at just saying it's a suspension. I would describe the suspension by the intervals above the bass note. This is a 9-8 suspension. 9 refers to the interval from F, the lowest note in my chord, the bass note, up to this G my suspended voice. It's a ninth. It's one bigger than an octave and it resolves down by step to the eight, to the octave. Eight, because eight is the number, the intervallic number between our bass note and the note to which we resolved, a nine-eight suspension. If you're thinking about calling it a two-one suspension, you're close, right? We typically reserve that analysis for uh, suspensions that literally form a unison with a bass. Otherwise, anything else we would call a nine-eight suspension. In the third measure, I've done the same thing. I have another typical suspension, a 4-3 suspension. It starts on a fourth, that's the interval between the C in the bass, the lowest note in my chord, and F, the suspended pitch. When the F resolves down by step to the E natural, that fourth becomes a third, and I've labeled it with a 3. This is a 4-3 suspension. 9-8 suspensions, 6-5 suspensions, 4-3 suspensions are all pretty common, and I even mentioned 2-1, the suspension that resolves to a unison in the bass. When we're analyzing suspensions, use these numbers to indicate the interval above the bass note. Suspensions get that special treatment when they're analyzed, and so we got to spend a little more time with them, but we'll breeze through some of our last examples here. The retardation is very, very, very similar to the suspension. It's approached by common tone, but instead of resolving down by step like a suspension, it resolves up by step. And that's it, very, very, very simple. And we can see my example here, my retardation from C to E resolves to that F major chord, the E not a part of that F major triad. And so when it resolves up by step, we know that it was a retardation. It was approached by common tone, and then it resolved up by step. I don't need to analyze my retardation with numbers like I do with the suspension. We really reserve that practice just for suspensions. I have one more common tone, non-chord tone to describe, which is the anticipation. The suspension and the retardation are approached by common tone and resolved by steps. The anticipation goes the opposite way. It's typically approached by step, and then resolves by common tone. A good way of thinking of the anticipation is that it's a non-chord tone that arrives at the next chord a little bit too early. Again, this is kind of the opposite of our suspension and retardation. And so in this example, we can see that we have a C major triad going to an F major triad. Our melody lands on that F just a little bit early. It lands on that F on beat four. Everybody else lands on the chord on beat one. The, the melody has anticipated the chord, and I would describe the F natural on beat 4 as an anticipation. It's a non-chord tone because F does not belong to the C major triad that's harmonizing it. It's an, antici it's an anticipation because it's been approached by step and resolved by common tone. It doesn't move, it just waits for the rest of the chord to line up with it. I've seen anticipations that are, that are approached by leap as well, and so I would label those as anticipations similarly, but the most common versions of this chord that you'll be encountering approach it by step. That's a quick rundown of all the different non-chord tones that we might be encountering in Western music. When we're analyzing non-chord tones, we have a basic system that we can use. The first step is to identify the primary chord, figure out what the main harmony is at a given moment. Then, we want to look for pitches that don't belong, and when we find them, when we encounter pitches that don't belong to the harmony, we ask ourselves, how is that pitch approached, and how is that pitch resolved? So in the example here, I have my two favorite chords, C major and F major, and I've already gone through and identified a number of non-chord tones. My C major triad in the first measure doesn't have B natural or D natural in it, and so I've labeled both of them as non-chord tones. And in my second measure, my F major triad does not have G or B natural in it, and so I've similarly labeled them as non-chord tones.
To describe what non-chord tones they are, I have to look at the approach and the resolution. So the first non-chord tone, B natural, is approached by step, and it resolves by step back where it came from, back in the opposite direction. This is a neighbor tone. My next non-chord tone, D natural, is also approached by step and resolved by step. But it's resolved by step continuing in the same direction rather than going back. This D natural is a passing tone. On the second measure, my G natural is approached by common tone. G was already there in the previous measure. It resolves upward by step. Approached by common tone and resolved upward by step means that the G natural in measure 2 is a retardation. And the B natural is, approach, is approached by leap from above and resolved by step back up. It leaps down and resolves up by step. Well, that's a textbook case of an appoggiatura. This is how I would be analyzing every non-chord tone. How did we get to it and how does it resolve? Those are the questions we have to ask. Today we covered eight different non-chord tones. Really roughly, this is the way I tend to think of them. There are the step non-chord tones, which are passing tone and neighbor tone. Then there are the non-chord tones that involve leaps. The appoggiatura, the escape tone, and the double neighbor, which is kind of a mix between steps and leaps, right? Two neighbor tones, but there's a leap in it. Finally, we have the common tone ones. The suspension and the retardation, very similar, both approached by common tone, but resolving in different directions. And the anticipation, the one that resolves via a common tone. Just a quick way of categorizing them so that they might be a little easier for you to remember. That's the end of this video. Today we talked about non-chord tones, a bunch of different types, the basics of just how we're going to be approaching them and how we're going to be analyzing them. If you have more questions, don't hesitate to let me know. Otherwise, have a great rest of your day.